I get a lot of emails, and sometimes those emails come in hot. Guns a-blazing, convinced something terrible is happening, and that I need to know about it immediately. Now, most of the time, those messages turn out to be based on misunderstandings, bad information, or dots being connected a little too aggressively. But a couple of months ago, I started seeing a pattern. Not panic or outrage like I'm used to, but careful measurements and thoughtful questions, and a small group of very detail-oriented viewers noticing something that they felt deserved a closer look. It was the kind of situation that could easily be misread, easily be exaggerated, and without clear information, quickly turn into something far bigger than it actually was. And unfortunately, I feel like that has started to happen. As we all know, in the absence of good information, people tend to fill in the gaps themselves. And that's why I feel I needed to make this video. So to get into this, let's start with, well, a car-based analogy, because that's kind of on brand for me. Zeke, give me that mid-roll, would you? Welcome back, everyone. I'm Caleb Dennison, and we're here to talk a little bit about OLED TVs, how they work, how one brand in particular chooses to approach them, and, well, here's that analogy that I promised. Imagine you bought a high-performance sports car that could do, like, 200 miles per hour when you rolled it off the lot. Now imagine that month after month, year after year, its maximum speed was quietly being reduced. After about four and a half years of driving it hard, the claimed top speed has dropped to 160 miles per hour. After 10 years, it maxes out at 100 miles per hour. You'd probably be pretty upset, right? Even if you don't drive it over 100 very often, you definitely don't want your car capped at half its original top speed, especially three and a half years before you'd likely have to replace it anyway. Now, take that same logic, you shouldn't, but take that same logic and apply it to an OLED TV. You bought a TV that could hit about 1400 nits of peak brightness when it was new, and then you read somewhere that someone else who owns the same TV noticed the number had gone down. They do some math and suggest that after about four and a half years, it could be down to roughly 1150 nits after nine years, closer to 700 nits. Well, you'd probably be upset by that too. You might even call foul. And if you were especially quick to connect dots that feel related, you might start assuming malintent where there is none. Then to help others understand that outrage, you might reach for an analogy, maybe even a car analogy, to explain what's going on to people who don't have that frame of reference. Well, that's kind of what's happening right now. And almost every part of it is getting twisted. I've even seen claims like, my OLED is going to be half as bright in six years, which is no. It is absolutely, it is not. Please calm down. Look, from misleading measurements made worse by taking them out of context to bad math to a poor understanding of how logarithmic changes in brightness actually work, and yes, to dots being connected that have no business being connected, a misleading narrative has emerged. And while the discussion is happening mostly among a few power users on enthusiast forums, I want to address this A, so it doesn't unnecessarily spiral out of control, and B, because this is going to start a larger conversation about what we can and should expect from our TVs. So let me be very direct about this. Has Sony been intentionally dimming its OLED TVs, or at least its QD OLED TVs, incrementally over time? Yes. Is it as simple as some people are making it sound online? Huge no. Did Sony have malicious intent? Absolutely not. Should Sony have disclosed this behavior more clearly? Probably. Should other brands have to do the same thing? Probably. Is there a scandal here? No. Should Sony ease up on how aggressively it manages QD OLED peak brightness over time? I think they can afford to, yeah. Is there a misunderstanding here? Absolutely, a big one. And we'll talk about where that misunderstanding is coming from. First though, let me say that I think it's completely fair for viewers and readers to question reviewers, including me, especially me, when new information surfaces that appears to challenge long-held positions, especially when that information involves intentional changes to product performance over time. Even if some of the concerns circulating online turn out to be rooted in misread or misused data, the questions themselves are reasonable and they deserve serious answers. That's why I'm here. Next, and just as importantly, if I'm gonna call what I do journalism, and I do, then I have a responsibility to dig into issues like this, to call manufacturers out when something isn't sitting right, and to push for better transparency and better outcomes on behalf of consumers. 
So file this one under analysis and op-ed. Now the good news here is that change is already happening. But before we get there, we need to talk about where this whole story actually started with some eagle-eyed AVS forum members taking long-term measurements of their Sony QD OLED TVs and reaching out to me about it, along with some information I have heard from trusted calibrator colleagues. And from there, we track things back another step to ratings.com. Let me be clear, I have no doubt that ratings has now and has always had good intentions. They aren't a villain in this. I applaud ratings for its ambition and its willingness to tackle projects nobody else has dared to try. They aim for thorough, transparent TV testing. They publish raw data, they explain their methodology, and they run tests that most manufacturers would much rather keep behind closed doors. And guys, that kind of work has value and often is very good for consumers. But what Ratings has been doing with OLED TVs, something they call accelerated longevity testing, that can produce results that are easily misread when taken out of context. Also, that word accelerated, it's doing a lot of heavy lifting. The TVs in Ratings longevity tests aren't being used the way you or I use a TV in a living room. Like, not even close. They're being run for extremely long hours every day, often near maximum brightness with static content designed to stress the panel as hard as possible. The goal isn't to simulate normal ownership. It's to push panels to their limits and see what breaks first and how. Again, that can provide us with valuable information if it's analyzed correctly. But in this story, at least, it's also where the first major misunderstanding creeps in. The first mistake is taking an accelerated stress test and applying a normal timeline to it. When people see a number like 17,000 hours, it's very easy to mentally convert that into six or seven years and just stop thinking there. But that only works if everyone uses their TV the same way, and they most certainly do not. Even for enthusiasts who watch a lot of TV, five hours a day gets you to 17,000 hours in closer to nine or 10 years. For average viewers, it's much longer than that. For little consumer electronics land context, that's already way longer than the five-year warranty you can get from LG on its best OLEDs or the seven-year promise from Samsung that it's gonna update your TV's firmware. The second mistake is confusing peak performance with typical performance. Ratings measures peak brightness using, well, a lot of methods, including standardized test windows, which I still think that's an important approach for reviews if for no other reason that it gives us a consistent way to compare displays, even if those tests do get game sometimes. But guys, peak HDR highlights are, by definition, peaks. They're fleeting, they're rare, they happen quickly, and they absolutely do not represent the brightness level of most scenes that you watch. Ask anyone who grades films in Hollywood. I'm a big fan of Maxine Gervais. Check out her Instagram. They'll all tell you the same thing. Most movies, shows, and games live nowhere near a TV's maximum net output, with the vast majority of scenes sitting somewhere in the 50 to 200 nit range, even in HDR. It's just like most cruising around happens at 60 or 70 miles per hour, not at a car's top speed. Classy Tech Calibrations has been preaching this for years, and I agree with him. The part of the picture that matters is down in the lower range anyway. The third mistake is assuming that brightness loss is linear and that it's linear in perpetuity. Brightness doesn't work that way. Human vision responds logarithmically. The difference between 1400 nits and 1100 nits is not perceived the same way as the difference between 700 nits and 400 nits. And yet, a lot of the discussion online treats every percentage drop as equally devastating, regardless of where it happens on the curve. Ratings didn't lie, and people reacting to the data aren't stupid, but when these assumptions pile up, they create a story that sounds scarier than the underlying reality. Another way of putting it, if you're old like me, is that we're making a mountain out of a molehill. But none of that means that Sony or any other brand should be off the hook. Sony has, in fact, been intentionally managing peak brightness over time on at least some of its OLED TVs. That's not speculation, it's something Sony has acknowledged and something professional calibrators have observed for a few years now. The real questions are why, how aggressively, and how transparent Sony should have been about it. From everything I've learned, uh, from testing, from conversations with calibrators, and from discussions with Sony itself, this is a 
conservative strategy, maybe too conservative, designed to manage long-term panel stability, uniformity, and burn-in risk under worst case usage. Still, having good intentions doesn't necessarily mean all the right decisions were made. Sony chose to prioritize long-term protection over preserving absolute peak performance indefinitely. Samsung, using the same QD OLED panels, appears to have made a different set of trade-offs. Their dimming is less aggressive, and that difference matters, especially when Sony is charging a premium. Where Sony might deserve some criticism is around transparency, because while other brands may also dim their OLED TVs in various ways, on the long term, they do so less aggressively. Look, if you're gonna deliberately manage peak performance over time, especially on a flagship product sold to enthusiasts, that behavior should be explained clearly and proactively, at least to enthusiasts who need to know and the calibrators who service them. I don't think this is something you print on the side of the box because it doesn't impact most consumers, but I don't think it should be buried in a service manual next to an asterisk. For sure, it's not something you want discovered years later through third-party stress tests and not left for forums to reverse engineer and argue about. I actually think it's a pretty tricky matter from a PR and marketing perspective. Explaining that you're drawing down the peak level performance of something for its long-term health, especially when others aren't doing it as dramatically, that's not gonna be easy. But that, I think, is a discussion for another time or another video. Let's snap back to the present. What is Sony going to do now? Well, Sony has told me that it's preparing a firmware update that will make the brightness adjustment process even more gradual over time. Sony told me that the ultimate goal is to balance the longevity of the TV with its performance in peak highlights. Obviously, Sony being Sony, they are still conducting comprehensive testing. But I'm told that we'll receive more updates closer to when this firmware update rolls out to customers. Now, I still don't have information about how a change in EOTF tracking or gamma might be addressed, but I tend to think most of the professionals or prosumers uh, who need those granular details looked at are probably already having their displays recalibrated on a schedule already. What Sony hasn't detailed yet are any numbers around this adjustment. However, if I were to make an educated guess slash do a little speculating, I'd bet that the dimming will be capped at a meaningfully lower level than it is today, rather than just continuing indefinitely, and that it will take considerably longer to reach that diminished cap. Now to me, that sounds like a controlled descent, like management. Like I said earlier, organic compounds inevitably change over time. And because of that, an OLED TV's performance is necessarily going to change. I'm on board with exercising control over how those changes take place. I just think maybe Sony was a bit too conservative with its estimates when they decided to do this. And I'm glad Sony is now willing to make a revision given it's got a good amount of data to draw from. Now that doesn't erase my criticism around transparency and it doesn't change what early adopters experience, but it does matter. It tells us that Sony is listening, that this feedback landed with them and that Sony isn't just flying on autopilot here. With all of that said, I think the most important question is and always has been, does this actually matter in real world viewing? It should absolutely not affect whether you buy or keep a Sony OLED or any other brand of OLED TV. If you already own a Sony QD OLED like the A95L, what you're getting today remains one of the most accurate and most refined images that you can buy. The processing is excellent. The tone mapping is excellent. Motion handling, color accuracy, shadow detail, the fundamentals that make a TV look great in real content, all are still very much intact, even as the panel ages. Now it's true that this isn't just about peak brightness. As OLED panels age and Sony adjusts how they're driven, there can also be subtle changes in how the TV tracks EOTF and gamma. Most viewers probably aren't gonna notice this, but some eagle-eyed enthusiasts might. And if they want it corrected, that requires a professional calibrator. That's a real limitation, and it's fair to acknowledge it. Even after some measurable performance decline, a Sony OLED like the A95L is still outperforming many brand new TVs released in the same year. 
In absolute terms, it may not hit the same peak numbers it once did, but in relative terms, it's still delivering reference class image quality compared to most of the market. At the same time, there are legitimate edge cases, particularly among professional and power users, where Sony's current approach can feel far more aggressive than maybe it intended. One example comes from a professional game developer, an HDR specialist, who used a Sony A95K as a PC monitor for extremely long daily sessions. Now in that scenario, the panel accumulated very high panel on hours, often 16 hours a day, even though actual on-screen brightness was kept very low and burn-in risk was carefully managed. Now Sony has since confirmed to me that its long-term dimming logic keys off of panel hours alone, not actual luminance output. So in this case of the professional game developer, from the TV's perspective, those were still extreme usage conditions. That doesn't make this experience invalid. It highlights a real limitation of a blunt, hours-based approach where safe but atypical usage can be penalized as if it's real worst case stress. For that class of user especially, I think Sony's implementation needs refinement. Sometimes we forget, but all electronics decline in performance over time. OLED TVs show it through reduced peak luminance and subtle tracking shifts. LCD TVs show it through diffuser degradation, dead pixels, aging backlights, and declining local dimming performance. Nothing is immune, degradation just presents itself differently. I don't see any compelling evidence suggesting that Sony's OLEDs are taking a bigger hit overall than other brands' TVs over the long term. Unfortunately for Sony, they're aging in a way that's easier to measure and easier to argue about. You know, plasma TVs are sometimes cited as having vastly superior longevity, but those half-life ratings were measured at dramatically lower brightness levels without HDR, wasn't even a thing, and against very different performance baselines. They lasted a long time, yeah, but they were never asked to do anything close to what modern displays are doing now. So look, I don't think Sony secretly crippled its TVs. Can't believe I have to say that out loud. There's no economic logic behind that. And there's no wave of real world complaints suggesting that Sony OLEDs are becoming prematurely unusable. Sony made a very conservative engineering choice. And it's fair to debate whether it was too conservative. And it's also fair to say Sony should have communicated things more clearly. But in the end, ratings didn't lie, consumers weren't wrong to ask questions, and Sony didn't act with malicious intent. All of those things are true at the same time. This is a case study in how complex technical data can be misunderstood once it leaves the lab and hits the internet. If you already own an OLED TV, I don't think there's any reason to panic or sell. If you're shopping for a new TV, I don't think this is a big red flag. It's probably not a deal breaker. It's definitely not a scandal. If you're a pro grade user, well, now you know what to expect going forward and you might wanna dig deeper. I think the bigger conversation we need to have right now is about how to communicate to new TV buyers what to expect when owning an OLED TV. When you buy a performance car, they tell you about the premium gas that you have to get, about the more frequent maintenance you must have performed, and about how more intense tuning will be needed to keep the car performing at its very best. Maybe we need to do something similar for OLED TV buyers. Huh, you know, when you look at it through a clear lens, maybe OLED TVs really are more like performance cars than I first thought. Thanks so much for watching everyone. There was a lot in this video and believe it or not, this was the short version. The conversation continues in future videos and in the comments of this video. Let me know what you think down there. How long should a TV last these days and why? Is it fair to expect all TVs to behave the same? Can't wait to see what you come up with and it's gonna inform future videos. Please hit that like button if you like, subscribe for more. I'll see you on the next one and until then, take care of yourself. And now we apply LCD TV rules to all display types. I mean, it's in the name, organic light emitting diode. By its nature, the technology starts to die the day you plug it in and turn it on. Does that mean you shouldn't buy one? No. I mean, OLED TVs are awesome and I'm, I'm gonna keep recommending them. <laughs>